In this video, we're going to be going over a CS50 practice problem called Prime. And this one's a little more difficult and a little more involved than the others. So make sure you watch all the way till the end and don't skip any part of the video if you want to fully understand it. Now let's jump straight into Prime. So the program should do this. It should ask the user for a range, minimum and maximum value, and then give the user all prime numbers within that range. So let's say the user inputs a minimum of 2 and a maximum of 10. Our program should output all prime numbers between 2 and 10, which in this case is 2, 3, 5, and 7. So I guess the next natural question becomes, how do we know if something is a prime number or not? Well, a prime number is something that can only be divided by 1 and itself. In other words, when you divide a prime number by any other whole number, you will always have a remainder. Let's do a quick example of that. So 4 divided by 2, which is another whole number, does not have a remainder. 4 divided by 2 is 2, not 2 point something, just 2. So we can say that 4 is not prime. Okay, because it doesn't have a remainder when you divide it by a whole number. What about 5? 5 divided by 2 has a remainder, it's 2.5. 5 divided by 3 is also 1 point something, so it does have a remainder. And 5 divided by 4 is also 1 point something, and it does have a remainder, right? So we can say that 5 is prime. So just to make this concept very clear, let's take an example of 9. So 9 divided by 2 has a remainder, right? It's 4.5. But that doesn't mean it's prime, because for it to be prime, it would need to not have a remainder when dividing 9 by all numbers between 1 to 9. So let's take the next step now from 2 to 3. 9 divided by 3 we see here does not have a remainder because 9 divided by 3 is 3, which means that 9 is not prime. So when you divide a number by all whole numbers between 1 and itself, and it does not have a remainder, that means that it's prime. And even if you divide it by one of the whole numbers result in a remainder of 0, that means that the number is not prime, as we see in this example of 9 here. So we understand the concept of prime versus not prime, but how do we actually implement this into code? Well, let's first take a look at the distribution code that they give us. Basically, okay, so the standard header files and then they have a function called prime which takes in an integer called number as input and gives out a bool or a true or false value and on the main function we can see that they're prompting the user for a minimum value and a maximum value using the get int functions and the conditions over here we see that the minimum needs to be greater than one at least and the maximum obviously needs to be greater than the minimum right so this is just prompting the user for input of the range and then over here we have a for loop so let's dig into this so for int i gets min okay which means start a loop and it initializes at the minimum value go all the way up until it's less than or equal to max, right? And go one by one, step by step, I++. plus plus. So what this is doing is let's say the user inputs a range of one till 10 or two till 10. Well, it's gonna go from two all the way up till 10. And it's gonna go one by one. So it's gonna go through two, three, four, five, six, seven, and so on. And if it's prime, then we wanna print it out. If it's not prime, then we don't wanna print it out, right? So if the user inputs a minimum value of two and a maximum value of 10, our program should print out 2, 3, 5, and 7, just as we discussed earlier. So our job now is to write this function called prime to check whether the number in the user's given range is prime or not. Okay, and how do we go about doing that in code? Well, let's take a look here. So it's pretty obvious that we're going to need two main loops. The first loop is to go through all the numbers within the range given by the user. So if the user inputs the range between 2 to 10, this first loop will go with 2, 3, 4, 5, and so on and so forth all the way up until 10, right? To go through all the numbers within the user's given range. And the second loop is to check whether or not the number is prime. Okay, and how do we do that? Well, over here, remember earlier, we said we go through all the numbers from 2 until that number minus 1, right? So if you want to check whether 5 is prime, we first divide it by 2, see if it has a remainder, divide it by 3, see if it has a remainder, divide it by 4, see if it has a remainder. So all the numbers from 2 until the number itself, minus 1. So the nested loop checks each number from 2 to that number to see whether it's prime or not. So just as a quick example, we see that 9 divided by 2 has a remainder. And now we go to the next number, 9 divided by 3. We can see that it does not have a remainder. So our function should return false. It's not a prime number because when you divide it by another number, it does not have a remainder or the remainder is 0. So whenever the remainder is zero, that means that function is not prime. So the logic is sound, but how do we do this remainder stuff in code? Well, it turns out that there is something called a modulo function, which gives us the remainder after dividing whole numbers. Okay, and this may seem a little confusing at first because it wasn't taught in the lectures, but this is just something we have to know and something you have to research on your own. But basically the modulo function 
is the remainder you get after dividing whole numbers. So how does it work? Well, we know that 7 divided by 2 is 3.5, right? It has a remainder. But 7 mod 2 is 1, because that's the remainder. So how do you think about this logically? Well, let's say you have 7 apples, and your basket can fit exactly 2. And this is a representation of 7 mod 2. Your mod is a basket size, and 7 is the number of apples you have. So we have 7. In the first basket, we put 2, and now we have 5 left. And now we have five apples, we put two in the basket, and now we have three apples left. And then we take another basket and we put another two apples, and now we have one left. Now this one apple can't fit in that basket because the basket can fit exactly two. It can't fit any more, it can't fit any less. It can fit exactly two apples. So over here, we'll fill three baskets, right? We fill three baskets, and then we'll have one apple remaining which can't fit in any basket. So this means that seven mod two is one. That's the number of apples we have remaining. Okay, just go through another quick example. Let's say now you have seven apples and your basket can fit exactly three. This is seven mod three. So in the first basket, we'll put three and then we're going to have four apples remaining. From those four, we take three apples and put them into the basket. And now we'll have one apple remaining. So in this case, we're going to fill two baskets and then we're going to have one apple remaining, which means seven mod three is one. We're getting the gist of it by now. So basically the rule for prime numbers is if at any point the number mod a whole number is zero, that means it's not prime and you can see why, right? Let's say you have four apples and your basket size is two. So you're gonna fill two baskets and have exactly zero apples remaining. So we can conclude that four is not a prime number. It's that simple. So basically this modular function, it, it might seem a little complicated at first, but it's just something you need to understand once and then you're gonna understand it forever. So think about it in terms of apples and baskets and it's denoted by the percentage sign. That's what you need to know. Now that we understand the concept of remainders and the modulo function, it sounds like now we will be able to write this function called prime. So let's take a look at the distribution code again. And over here, we can see that the first loop they've already given us, right? This loop goes through all the numbers from the minimum till the maximum. And if it's prime, then print out the prime numbers. So this loop is already within the loop that goes through all the numbers. So we just need to make the second loop, which is the nested loop, to check whether or not the number is prime. And now we have a pretty good idea on how to do that with the modulo function. So let's take a look at that. Okay, so they have to do and return false. Let's ignore the return false for now. So let's make a for loop, right? And how much do we want to initialize this to? Well, we know that we want to start at two and go all the way up until that number, and we want to go one by one. So let's just uh, make a variable, let's call it j. And how much do we want to initialize it to? Two, right? So for in j gets two, and so what's the maximum value we want it to go up to? We want it to go up till the number itself, right? So j less than number. So keep on going until it reaches the actual number itself and j plus plus, which just means go one at a time. So this loop is basically initializing it to two, going all the way up till the number, right? As we said here, when we want to do it for five, we said that, okay, we started two, five divided two has a remainder, now we go to the next, we go to three, we go to four. And if all of them have a remainder, that means it's not prime. But if even one of them doesn't have a remainder, that means it's not prime. So this is the for loop. So now if the number mod, the whole number, which is j in this case, is equal to zero, that means it's not prime, right? So we want to return false. Otherwise, we want to return true, which means it is prime. And this, what we've written here, is nothing more than what we've done with 5 at the beginning. So we initialize at 2, right? We check 5 divided by 2, 5 divided by 3, 5 divided by 4. So it's going to keep on going. And the moment it reaches something with a remainder of 0, that means we return false. It's not a prime number and we don't want to print it. Okay, so let's check our code now. Let's try to compile. See if we made any mistake. Okay, we didn't make any mistakes. Let's go to compile. Let's run it. Let's say minimum of 2, maximum of 10, and it prints out 2, 3, 5, 7. Perfect, so it seems to be all correct, but just to double check, let's use the check 50 function here. And while we're waiting for that, I know this problem set was a little bit complicated because we got introduced to a lot of new concepts, right? Like defining a prime number and then modulo, but I promise it all gets easier with time. If there was anything you didn't understand, please make sure to rewatch the video first and focus. And if you still don't understand something, make sure to leave a comment down below. I'll do my best to get to it. And in case you need private tutoring, feel free to email me at rahul at cs50madeeasy.com. That's going to be private one-on-one -on -one tutoring for you if you need it. And now we can see that it's all green, which means it's all good. And if you enjoyed this video, please make sure to like the video, subscribe to the channel with notifications on for weekly CS50 videos. And that's all for this one. Thanks for watching, guys. Bye, David.